Hi. SVD does not stand for Socratically Robust Dragons, unfortunately. Sorry, Dragon Pals. But in this video, you'll learn what it does stand for. Before we jump into SVD, let's look at diagonalization real quick. Um, for a square matrix with linearly independent eigenvectors, we're going to call it A, you can write it as P, D, P inverse, where P is a matrix with columns that are the eigenvectors of A, and D is a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues of A along the diagonal, and P inverse is just the inverse of P. Now, why is this actually useful? Primarily, we diagonalize matrices because we want to raise them to a high power, and that's a lot of matrix multiplication for a person or for a computer. And so if A is really big, or the exponent is really big, instead of all of that matrix multiplication, you can just raise the eigenvalues in D to the appropriate power. And the proof of this is you can write out all of the PDP inverses and see that the P inverse times P cancels, and you just end up with the first P and the last P inverse, and all of the D matrices multiplied together in the middle, N times. So A to the N equals P times D to the N times P inverse. And this is a lot nicer than trying to multiply A N times. So this is really useful um, if A is a Leslie matrix, which has the percentage change in a time step for a population, and we want to see many, many years in the future the long-term behavior of that population, it's much easier to just exponentiate scalar eigenvalues instead of an entire matrix. So just for some practice, try an example with a diagonalization. Here's a matrix you can try and check with our work here. So take a moment to do that. You can pause the video if you need to and see if you get what we got. And now try raising that matrix to a power of 3 or to other powers and seeing how a cubed, if you multiply it out, is the same thing as doing p d cubed p inverse. And that'll be the same with any power. And so if you would like to try a few, you can pause the video and try that. All right, now that you're back. Some matrices are really special. They're not just square, but they're also symmetric, which means that they're of this form, where the rows and the columns could be reversed and it would still be the same matrix. And you can see an example of that here. And we have a matrix S that's symmetric and square. And we're going to find its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors, which you can see here. And you can be doing this along with us or you can just believe us. But here they are. And now these are actually really special eigenvectors. They're linearly independent, which is really great, and they're orthogonal, so they're perpendicular. And if you don't believe us, we'll show you. So we can show that by taking dot products. And if you know about dot products, uh, orthogonal vectors will have a dot product of 0. And so we've done it here. v1.v2 is 0, v1.v3 is 0, and v2.v3 is 0. So they're all orthogonal to each other, which is pretty cool because that's a very special sort of basis that has three orthogonal eigenvectors. Unfortunately, we're not quite done. We need not only orthogonal eigenvectors, but they need to be orthonormal, which means they're also length 1 to do SVD. And so, fortunately, that's not actually that hard. We just divide each eigenvector by its magnitude, and we've done that here. And we get these new eigenvectors. They're pretty cool because they're orthogonal, but they're also really going to need to be orthonormal for SVD. So we're going to need to divide them by their magnitude, and we've done that here. So they need to be perpendicular, which is orthogonal, and normal, which is length 1, and we smash those words together into orthonormal. And orthonormal eigenvectors are pretty special, so that's what we want for SVD. There's a special case here where you have repeated eigenvalues, and you're going to have some trouble with making an orthonormal basis, and so you need to use Gram-Schmidt to come up with some more appropriate eigenvectors, but we're not going to do that right now because that's a whole other process. So that'll be a different video sometime. So moving along, there's something nice about these square symmetric matrices and their orthonormalized eigenvectors, which is what we just did, which is that when you diagonalize them, for example the S we had 
into P D P inverse, you might notice that P inverse is the same thing as P transpose. So if you look at this, P transpose stands for when you turn the rows into columns. And you can see that I've switched those there for you to see. The fact that P inverse is P transpose in the case of orthonormalized eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix, that's a special case, is really convenient for diagonalization because instead of finding the inverse, we can just take the transpose. So to diagonalize, a square symmetric matrix, we just find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors, divide the eigenvectors by their magnitude to normalize them, we put the eigenvalues into D along the diagonal and the eigenvectors into P as columns, we write P transpose, and we can just diagonalize it by saying that S equals P D P transpose. It's really important to remember for later steps to put the eigenvalues in descending order. So put them along the diagonal from greatest to least and make sure that they're still with their corresponding eigenvectors in the right space. So if you move an eigenvalue, you also need to move its eigenvector. Now, what if the matrix isn't square? What do you do then? That's terrible. Don't worry, we've got a solution. It turns out that even if a isn't square, a transpose times a and a times a transpose are, and they're symmetric. If you don't believe me, I'll prove it. So here we have a, it's m by n, and a transpose, which is n by m. And if you multiply a transpose times a, you end up with an n by n matrix. And if you multiply a times a transpose, you have an m by m matrix, and those are both square. And you can try an example if you don't believe me still. We can also show that A transpose times A and A A transpose are symmetric just with some matrix multiplication. So you can see I've written them with letters and this looks really big and complicated. So if you are more comfortable with numbers, you can just try some number matrices. But I've done it out here and you can look through it for a moment and see that along the diagonal there are unique values. But if you were to switch the rows and columns, you would still have the same matrix, both for A transpose A and for A A transpose, which indicates that they are symmetric. And we're gonna try working with an A with some numbers now. So I've written A here, and I've multiplied out A transpose times A and A times A transpose. We like A transpose times A and A A transpose because they're square and symmetric, and we know how they're related to our original matrix A. We like square symmetric matrices because we know that they have special properties, whereas our original matrix A was really difficult to deal with. It's rectangular, it might be really big, we don't really know what to do with it. So we're going to orthonormally diagonalize A transpose A and A A transpose, which is what we did before, where we divide the eigenvectors by their magnitudes, and we end up with a special matrix. So. Instead of P, since we have two different matrices, we're going to use V for A transpose A and U for A A transpose. And so you can try it right now with that matrix we had. All right, so we've kind of lost track of A, but it's coming back into the picture now. We have A transpose A and we have A A transpose and we have their orthonormal diagonalizations. But where is A in all of this? So here's where it is. We want to find the eigenvalues and vectors because they allow us to learn things about a matrix that's big and troublesome by just dealing with scalars and vectors. So we want to write A as a combination of scalars and vectors because it's big and messy and scalars and vectors are nice and simple. But we only know how to use that using diagonalization and that only works on square matrices and A isn't square. But it's okay because we have A transpose A and A transpose and so they're square even though A isn't square, and we've broken them down into scalars and vectors. So now we just need to take A transpose A and A A transpose and turn them into A. And there's a proof for this, which again, we're not going to leave for another time, but we promise we can do it. That if you have A transpose A equals V D V transpose, and you have A A transpose equals U D U transpose, then you can write your original matrix A as U sigma V transpose. Now, where did this sigma come in here? 
The matrix sigma is inspired by the matrix D. So we had D before with the eigenvalues all along the diagonal and zeros all around them. And now we have sigma and it has the square root of those same eigenvalues along the diagonal and zeros all around them. And these square root of lambda i, which is all the little lambdas, are called the singular values of a, where lambda sub i is the eigenvalue of a transpose a or a a transpose, which are actually the same. And you might have noticed this when you were going through the orthonormal diagonalization of those matrices. But we have to take a second to look at some dimensions because that sigma actually wasn't quite right. Um, we want to multiply these three matrices together and get A, but we don't really know what dimension sigma needs to have to make that happen. So let's look at dimensions. We have A is M by N, and we have A transpose is N by M, and so when we multiplied out A transpose A, we got a matrix that was N by N, and therefore V was N by N, and when we multiplied A times A transpose, we got M by M, and U was M by M. And so if we take A, which is M by N, and we want to make it equal to U sigma V transpose, we have M by M times something times N by N. And if we want the dimensions to work out, we need sigma to be M by N, which is the same dimensions as A. And so to make that happen, we just throw in some zeros. So here's a big reveal. All of those square root of lambda i's give SVD its name, singular value decomposition, where singular value refers to square root of lambda sub i. But what's this? What's decomposition? Turns out we're not done yet. Unlike diagonalization, which is primarily for long-term behavior, like we talked about with the Leslie matrix, SVD is going to help us pull really important information out of our matrix A. What really important information? We'll tell you that later. But let's talk about how. It's called spectral decomposition. There's the decomposition. We're going to rewrite A equals U sigma V transpose as a big linear combination, which is a decomposition, and see just how amazing and useful these terms are. So here we go. If you imagine that U is composed of a bunch of columns, U sub 1, U sub 2, etc., U sub n, which are the eigenvectors of a, a transpose, and sigma, which has the singular values along the diagonal, and then V transpose has the eigenvectors of A transpose A as rows, remember it's transpose, then when you do this multiplication, it's the same thing as saying U1, singular value 1, V1 transpose, plus U2, singular value 2, V2 transpose, etc., all the way up to U sub n, singular value sub n, v sub n transpose. Now this is a big jump, and so I encourage you to try a little example and see how the zeros work out and how the columns all work out. So why is this so desirable? Why do we want this big messy decomposition? It seems kind of complicated. Well, each term pulls a specific, really important piece of information out of A. So the first term, u sub 1, singular value 1, V1 transpose is called the first order approximation of A. It's really special because it's like the most important information. It's the essence of A. It's a pretty rough estimate, but it represents A in some really important ways. And depending on your application, you want that first term to tell you something special about your matrix A. And like a Taylor series, each time you add a term onto that first term, it gets a little bit closer to the actual A. How do we use this? giant messy decomposition. Well, if we have a really big matrix, A, and we really just don't want to deal with it. We're trying to find information from it, but it's just huge and it's making our program run slowly or it's making our calculations super difficult. For example, an image can re be represented as a matrix in which each entry gives information about one pixel. So it'll be the color of that pixel, for example. And you can imagine that for a nice image, this makes a really big matrix. And here's where SVD comes in to the rescue. Imagine you have a 512 by 512 picture. That's 512 pixels on each side. 
and therefore you have a 512 by 512 matrix with 512 eigenvalues and 512 eigenvectors. That's a lot of information. So you do a spectral decomposition and find that with only 100 terms you can create basically what is your photo. So you don't even need those other 412 terms. You have a pretty good version of your photo just with 100 of them. And so this is image compression. You've just taken a really huge number of data entries and brought it down to a pretty reasonable number because SVD pulls the most important information out of A and puts it up front in the spectral decomposition. This all relies on you putting the eigenvalues in descending order so that the biggest, most important ones are at the front. You might be wondering what else SVD can do because maybe you're not interested in image compression. Maybe you like your images nice and big. Well, you can do cryptography. If you know a little bit about how frequently letters show up in a, any particular language's text, and you have some text that's been put through a cipher, you can use SVD to figure out how many steps the cipher had and what this text might say. You can recommend things like Google or a librarian. SVD can help you find, based on one thing you're interested in, what else you might be interested in. Or you can look at social affinities, like who might be likely to hang out with who or who might be likely to agree with another person, or be agreed with. And there are lots of other applications of SVD that you can totally look into on your own time. Thank you for watching this video about singular value decomposition. We hope you're super excited to look up more applications and see how it works more in depth.